Um, it's always my pleasure to speak after lunch when everyone's in a subtle food coma. So thank you very much for that. Um, thank you for the bio. Um, I did recently retire. It was about time. Um, and I currently, and most people don't know, but AAPG currently has uh, a sustainable development committee. So you will be seeing hopefully more and more sustainable and uh, sustainability related topics at all of the AAPG meetings and forums uh, worldwide. So this presentation is all about giving you food for thought. I have a few quotes I'd like to share with all of you. Um, we've been talking about scenarios and everyone's presented a different one. I'm glad I chose a different one. So um, here's a slide of a BP projection of the future. And I think we should all get together 10 years from now to see how all this shakes out. But in reality, they're just what they are projections. So as many speakers have mentioned, energy demand continues to grow throughout the world in different areas at different rates. And what I really like about this graph is it shows the decline and the increase in the different energy forms. The dash vertical line in the middle is where we are today. So everything to the left of the line has already occurred and to the right is the future. So we can see the decline in coal and oil demand and the projected increase of natural gas, more clean burning to help fuel the transition that we're currently in and leading towards the growth of the renewables. And carbon capture and storage are part of that. It will allow us to utilize fossil fuels as we go through the transmission. A lot of these quotes um, have the references on the slides. A lot of them are from UK sources or US sources or news sources. So. Keep your eye on the bottom, you'll see a real changeover as we go from slide to slide. But because of the role of, ge I'm a geoscientist, so I'm gonna talk about geoscience. When I first started in industry in 40 years ago, it looked very, very different than it does today. There were no computers, by the way, or if we were using computers, they were the size of this room. So nobody really used them, everything was on paper, but we did have really cool colored pencils. Okay, today things are so different. As my predecessor just mentioned, um, churning through the huge volumes of data and finding out what's important is imperative going forward. And I think there's gonna be that demand for geoscience and engineering going forward. So what is the role of geology? We put this little diagram together um, at AAPG to take a look at what sustainable development means. Okay, in the traditional sense, you have exploration, um, you have production and development, and enhanced recovery. Enhanced recovery is very important when it comes to carbon. And we also talk about the economics of our industry. They change, and that's what makes our industry somewhat volatile when you have a commodity price of something, right? The price goes up, the price goes down, the price goes up, it goes down. We talk about being in downturns and upswings, and now we're in what I like to call not only the transition, but the new normal for us. And here's a very nice quote, and this is also where the role of the geoscientist becomes very, very important. Other people alluded to this earlier. Regulation is coming at us pretty fast. It, it always has been for the petroleum industry as a whole. But when we talk about carbon capture, utilization, and storage in the UK, for example, and in the United States, most of our elected officials are not geoscientists. There are some, so maybe. But it's up to us to help educate them so that when they do pro produce regulation, law, guidelines, whatever you want to call them, that they're scientifically sound and industry appropriate. So there's a role for geoscientists there as well. Here's a very interesting graph that I recently just got my hands on that I found very exciting actually. And it's really more complicated than it looks. It has multiple axes with multiple values and, and all kinds of good stuff. 
and it starts as early as 1970 and moves its way up to the 2000s. But the most interesting thing on this graph, if I had to summarize it in a nutshell, is that you look at the dramatic increase since 2000 in the carbon capture and storage projects. It's an incredible increase, exponential. And if you look at the light, I think it's light blue or green. Is that light blue or green? Green, let's say green. There's a dark blue and a green. The green at the very top of the bar graph represents the growth of CO2 into geologic storage. So what does that mean? Geologically stable storage. Who is best to do that than the people who understand the subsurface the best? And those are the geoscientists. Now the dark blue, if we take a look at that, that's the dramatic increase in CO2 associated storage from EOR, enhanced oil recovery. Now that's another interesting process because as some of you know, and if you do, that's great, but for those of you who don't, sometimes CO2 can be injected back into a reservoir to help the hydrocarbons flow out. Some of the CO2 comes back, some of it stays in the ground. So then you have the storage associated with that. The volumes are a little different. So we're talking about two different striped animals here that are of the same species, so to speak, both requiring geology along with engineers. I have to give them some credit when it comes to enhanced oil recovery, but working together with the geoscientists and the engineers mm -hmm. are very, very important. I work at Slumberger, geoscientists were a minority and uh, which was very different from when I worked for an operator when I was in exploration. I worked with a team of 30 plus geologists exploring for oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico. It was a geologist's dream, every day putting together a new puzzle. Then I decide years later, a career goes on, I moved to Schlumberger where you're a geoscientist, what do you even do, you know? So, but I think working together, solving the mysteries of carbon capture and storage would uh, definitely be very prudent. Let's take a look at the bigger picture. This is not a complete list. This is just a sampling of companies that as I was searching on the internet are involved with carbon capture and or storage. Some of them are here today, some are not. I might have missed a few and I apologize if you're here and I missed you. But the most important thing is the world is a complicated place and there's lots of different sectors that are very dependent on energy as we saw from playing around with the calculator it would be really, really helpful to create a balance. If we could become carbon neutral or even carbon negative in certain sectors, that would help the balance going forward in terms of dealing with other sectors that are very heavily dependent on the energy dense fuels that will take more technology and maybe a bit longer to bring their emissions down. And one of those is aviation. And if you follow Richard Branson or some of the people in the areas of aviation, there are people working on this, um, but it's not as far along as other sectors. The trucking industry actually has come quite a bit, um, moved in that direction as well. So what do we do to move the transition forward? Carbon capture is a viable option, and I'm sure some of my fellow speakers will be talking on a more technical level about the carbon ca about carbon capture. Uh, Slumberger is involved in it as well in, in certain projects around the world. But can we use oil and gas to fuel the transition? Can we make the transition move faster? And I think we can because we, while we're transitioning, we can reduce emissions and carbon capture and storage is one way to do that. And that's within nine seconds. 
So thank you very much. <laughs>